welcome everybody to Terzo Mondo. We're so happy to be here for our second concert of, of uh, whale music, Berlin. Berlin is known for its whales uh, in the rivers and the canals. And, uh, however, it was in Hawaii that we met each other first and uh, started playing music live with whales. We couldn't get any of these Hawaii whales to come here. So we have like recordings of them, which isn't our favorite thing. You're going to hear a lot of music made together with these whale recordings and without. And there's going to be a little bit of talking and a little bit of imagery and videos about this, this project. And uh, we've got uh, Tristan Bitter here. On, uh, what, what's this instrument you're playing? What do you call this? Harpoon. Okay, right. <laughs> Nora Pertz is uh, playing exclusively the most ancient of musics in this instrument. And I'm David Rothenberg. And uh, someone asked me the other day, why would you play clarinets with whales? I guess you'll find out. <laughs> Thanks, clarinet. Uh, so, here we go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
you need underwater microphones to hear this. And these were kind of invented and developed by the United States Navy listening in the Cold War for enemy submarines. Something, secret activities. And they were a little disappointed to hear the sounds of whales. And because the sounds of whales were these regular patterns, they seemed like some secret code. And they thought maybe this was something that the Russians were using to communicate. Maybe they had trained the whales. Regardless of that, they decided in the late 1950s that we can't let people find out about this. It's very classified information. Until the end of the 1960s, when somebody just pointed out, look, these sounds are so beautiful. We have to let people hear them. Come on, like 10 years, we haven't found out anything secret from this. So let it loose. And so they gave the recordings to these young scientists, Roger Payne and Scott McFay. You figure out what's going on. And these scientists kind of became musicologists of whale. And they, 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 they made these sonograms, these printouts of the structure, and they, they taped them all together and laid them on the floor. It's very hard to make a sonogram in 1969. And then they realized there was all this structure here. said something very unscientific. The humpback whale emits a series of surprisingly beautiful sounds. And here you're going to hear the structure of this song. It's not just like, most people have asked, what does a whale sound like? It's going to make one sound. But it's the way the sounds are fit together that makes it really like a piece of music. And if you're like a human and you want to figure out how to interact with this, how to engage with it, there's many different ways to do that. So now in this piece, you're going to hear each of us do it one at a time, showing how our instruments and our attitudes to our instruments can play along with the song. And this is an unadulterated whale song. Only the background ocean noise is taken out. This is actually what it sounds like at the regular speed. And so you think whether this is music or not after what I've just told you. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so um, the structure of the humpback whale song was like a surprise to anyone who thought they knew what went on under the sea in 1971. Around the same time, the same scientists said, well, we can't just like study this. We have to like let everyone hear it. So they released an album called Songs of the Humpback Whale, which eventually became the number one best-selling nature recording of all time, a multi-platinum album that was like something everyone had on the shelf to listen to. It, it became like just a sound of the time. And, and it came with a 48-page big booklet inside the record in English, Russian, Japanese, about the fact that we were like killing all these whales and saying these beautiful songs. And you might say, oh, everyone knows that. But at the time, even environmentalists didn't really think about whales because people weren't really seeing them. They were out there being decimated. They were hard to find because we had such good harpoon technology for just killing them, the motorized electric harpoons. And so Scott McVeigh, one of these scientists, he went to Japan armed with boxes of records and played these things for whaling executives and on TV and radio and some of these people would just move to tears. People heard whale songs, they used to start to cry. They found it so beautiful. Why do people find these sounds so beautiful? You know, there's similar range to the human voice, to the sounds of a cello or a bass clarinet or something. And they just have this musicality, this kind of emotional energy that really touched so many people. And by 1986, most countries in the world agreed to stop killing whales. And I think generally believed it's all because of this song that touched people so much. So we're going to play a more like a, like natural with background noises kind of whale song and play along with it. And see if you can hear, recover that sense of what it would mean to hear such a song for the first time and realize that just as human beings were going to outer space and landing on the moon, they were realizing that in the sea right here was this incredible music. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you. Okay, so, so we've played all these, uh, you know, we've played along with these recordings of whales, but we started doing this, we immediately went, and went out and did it live. And so we have like a six minute video demonstrating this activity, right? Are you ready to play that for us, Jeroen van der Bovenkamp, who made this video with us? Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to watch this version of ourselves. Of our past self. Yeah, so let's sit down here. Whales have been singing for millions of years. This is the real classical music. This is the real ancient stuff. And we're just humbly trying to find a place within it to, to join in with it. The whales know that this song evolved over millions of years, has this resonance in their culture, in their biology. We know it's right for them. Humans have no idea what the right human music is. We're constantly changing it. We're never satisfied.
listening to the sea, joining in with it, actually being here, is what's so important. I'm not saying everybody fly to Hawaii and do this, but go outside, wherever you are. Listen. What's happening? Imagine what it might be to join in with that, with you in that place. We don't know what music means. We don't know what human music means. We don't know what whale music means, but we know that it touches us deeply. It touches you emotionally. That makes it a lot easier to grasp. You can get it even if you don't know what it means. Where we uh, where we pre met and uh, Jeroen was with us. He was a filmmaker, and I've been collaborating with Jeroen since 2019. We worked on our first film called Underwater, and it was yeah. So I'm from the Netherlands. I'm Tristan, and where I'm from, it's a it's an island, uh, Tristan. It's called, and on that island there was a Dutch Arctic explorer called Willem Barents. He was a bowhead whaler. And he used to, um, yeah, in the 1500s, 1593, he started his uh, journey. He wanted to find the North, Northeast Passage. He wanted to sail the route from Europe to Asia uh, via the Northeast route. And uh, it's supposed to be a shorter route than going through the South, uh, as they do still now. They don't sail this route uh, to, uh, to Asia, it's still a lot. But uh, yeah, he wanted to find his route and he was a bowhead whaler. And I, I knew his name all along. There are statues of this guy on, on the island where I'm from. So Willem Barents, and he, he got beached on this island, Nova Zemla in Russia. Um, yeah, so, um, and uh, uh, fast forward in, in 2019, I, I was uh, uh, playing with my hydrophones. So I acquired hydrophones to listen to the underwater soundscape, to, to record uh, waves from underwater. I was curious how the waves would sound from the perspective on the water and by accident I found out how a ferry would sound like from a far distance like the ferry to the island from from a distance uh, of six kilometers I recorded the sound of the ferry and to me it was a very annoying sound like disturbing for me the yeah the soundscape and it was uh, it got me into the, the subject of noise pollution in the ocean and I wanted to make a film about it like how we humans uh, create sounds on the water which affects the animals uh, because the animals use sound like very yeah I, I, I had this quote in the film like what so what what seeing is for us is what hearing is for animals they use sound to navigate also to see they see with sound uh, which is a nice you know a redundance I think and um, so then I thought like in this film how, how do I want to tell the story about how we humans affect the underwater soundscape. And I came up with the idea, what if a whale would react to my guitar playing? What if, what if I can get an interaction going on with the whale? I could show in a really nice way that the animals hear us and react to it. And I heard of David Rothenberg at that point. We didn't know each other and I looked him up online and I wrote him a message. I was like, hey, I'm about I want to try this as well. I knew he, wa he was doing this for years already. And I, I was like, okay, I want to try this. Uh, uh, and there's an option of me going to Greenland, where there are gonna be whales in this time. And uh, we met up in Amsterdam, you were there for a project. We met up and I acquired this book, Thousand Mile Song. And uh, there I went to Greenland to try this with this on water speaker and a guitar and trying to play for the whales. And they were so silent, like for the two weeks I was there and uh, I was reading in my bunk every night like this book there I found out the humpback whale don't sing a song in the Arctic they only sing in springtime in warmer places around the equator so I was like ah oh, they don't sing their song here and later on I found out this bowhead whale they do sing a song in the Arctic so I had to go out uh, back to the yeah to this region where the, where the, where the bowhead whale swims 
And uh, last year, me and Jeroen, we stepped on the board of the May West by Dutch skipper Andre Speet. He's, uh, yeah, he's up in the Arctic right now doing the Northwest Passage for the second time. And yeah, we stepped on board to sail the Northwest Passage, which is the opposite route Willem Barents took in the 1500s. It's, it's the Northwestern Hemisphere, the northernmost route uh, you can sail in summertime. When it opens up, it's still like the question every year if it's uh, if you can sail it. And we were the the sixth vessel. Seventh. We were the seventh, seventh vessel sailing under Dutch flag this mm -hmm. route. So it's it's still very um, yeah. I would say rare to sail there on a, on a yeah. sailboat, 15 meters, you know. And, and the goal of this route for me was like to find a bowhead whale <laughs> and to record the song of this whale. And we, yeah, we sailed for two and a half months. I saw one bowhead pop his head up and it was like, wow, there's a bowhead. But the weather was too heavy. I couldn't throw the iPhones overboard. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but at the end of the trip, there was a very quiet day and we saw a whale again and I threw the hydrophones overboard and there it was like, two hours straight on like this symphony of bowheads like communicating on the water mm. and it was uh, it was pretty amazing yeah yeah let's listen to it <laughs>
okay in your uh, whale education. You, we have humpback whales, you've heard. Bowhead whales are closely related to them. They're both baleen whales. They comb the sea with these like comb, like baleen mouths that instead of teeth, so they, they just eat all the tiny floating plankton in the sea. That's one basic kind of whale, baleen whales. The other kinds are toothed whales like dolphins and killer whales, orcas, and sperm whales, and they have like little teeth, and they make whole different kinds of sounds that, I don't know, some people would say are further from music. They use echolocation, so they're making clicking, creaking door sounds to find where they are underwater. The baleen whales do not do that. They also do some very weird thing that was a real surprise that scientists discovered in the 70s and 80s. They also used these clicks to identify different families and groups of whales. So they were the first species of whale where people talked about them having culture. They learned different behavior. So yes, animals have culture, not just people, which means the groups of them learn different behaviors and pass them on to their offspring. That's what culture is. And now, it, when I started researching this, this was a kind of more radical idea, like 20 years ago. And now it's pretty much accepted that whales have culture. Sperm whales making totally different kinds of sounds. They're not doing these long songs, but little bits and snippets of rhythm. So this piece is sort of made out of the sounds of sperm whales. You'll see they're not all, uh, this isn't just straight how they would sound, but kind of the little clicks, the family clicks, the echolocation clicks turned into kind of music, completely different sound world, but different kind of whale. Thank you. 
three months ago, I started a, dec a new decade. I'll let you decide which one. And uh, yeah, I wanted to go somewhere far away to explore my creativity. And so I got in touch with this artist in, he had a large estate in Maui. And so I bought a plane ticket there. And two weeks before I got there, he told me that there were going to be these musicians there making music with whales and if I would be interested in joining them. And I said, at first my thought was, oh yeah, you know. So I looked up uh, David and I saw he was uh, an expert in Nachtigall and in nightingales. And so I thought, okay, well, I know there's a lot of um, classical music written about nightingales, so maybe I'll ask him if I could come and perform this. And then uh, I talked with David and he said, oh no, we're improvising. And my first impulse as a classical musician was, oh shit, you know. I, I can't do this, you know, I have to have music written in front of me. And then I was like, you know what, Nora, you're going to Maui to explore your creativity, just do it, dive in, and yeah, so I met these three guys, um, and we had about 15 minutes rehearse, and then baptism through fire, we, we did it, and it's, yeah, it's amazing, because improvising is something that you can't really practice, you just have to do it, and you can't rehearse for the unknown. You can't rehearse for the unknown, and there we are, yeah, there's our debut in Maui. And yeah, and so they graciously invited me to join them on the ship the next day. And of course, we couldn't bring a piano on board. So I decided to sing, and I sang them some jazz songs. Um, my grandmother was a jazz singer. She would have turned 98 today. So um, I sang her, I sang the whales, um, some, of the, some of the songs that she had liked to sing, and I sang them the Schubert song, Im Frühling. And uh, I think, maybe I'm a little biased, but I think the whales particularly reacted to the human voice. Uh, <laughs> but, um, Just your voice, not <laughs> like the human voice. <laughs> your human voice. But it was funny because then the next day, um, I was driving by the same part of the ocean where we were singing to them the day before, and I happened to turn on the classical music um, station, and what song comes on but um, Imprudent by Schubert. And then I look out at the water, and I see this whale just jump out. Mm -hmm. So it was some sort of a sign that this was, this is a creative, um, yeah, creative exploration that needs to be a part of my life right now. And I'm so thrilled to have brought you guys to my home trip of Berlin to explore this a little bit Thanks so much, more. Nora. And yeah, maybe. So yeah, when you meet the whale, yes, you must ask yourself, what would Schubert do? <laughs> <laughs> and you should also remember, what we learned from the late, great Wayne Shorter, who was fond of saying, you cannot rehearse. And one other thing about, too, about whales is, you know, in classical music, we have a lot of songs inspired by the other creature that we know that sings, the birds. And, um, yeah, I just, it, it got me thinking, what would, have Sch what would Schubert and Brahms and Debussy have thought if they could have heard whales sing? You know, how would that have been?
Thank you. You are a perk. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming.